Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today's topic is surviving the LTL market with my friend Todd Trumpeter. How's it going, Todd? Good, Joe. How you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast. It's nice to have a fellow Michigander on the podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Go green. Yeah, go blue over here. But uh, that's all right. I like I like the I like both the teams. So so Todd, please introduce yourself and your company. Sure. So Todd Trumpeter, I'm the Vice President of Logistics Operations here at Blue Grace Logistics. So what does Blue Grace do? I, I know everyone recognizes the name, but they're probably going, what do those guys do? Yeah, absolutely. So Blue Grace is a full service third party logistics company. Um, we've got a couple pieces to our company. We really, we, we kind of do it all in logistics. Um, we have our brokerage and truckload side. Um, and then my focus is on our managed logistics side, which is the you know fully managed transportation contractual business with our clients. Very nice, very nice. So, Todd, before we get into the topic today, which is a big one, please tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Give us some career highlights. What kind of kid were you? Sure. I grew up in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Oh, uh, nice. So, yeah, so I grew up there, North Farmington High School graduate, and then I went on to Michigan State. So I have a supply chain degree from Michigan State University. Huge, huge, huge football and hockey fan. So... You should also say, I, I know people are listening and saying, no, my school is, but typically Michigan State is recognized as the number one supply chain school, maybe in the world, but certainly here in the United States. And I know every once in a while someone will say, no, there's this school or that school, but they always get listed on, it is top notch. They do. It, it is. It's an outstanding program. And, and of course, when I was a student there, I'd never heard of supply chain before. I think my, my goal is to be a dentist when I started college, which... I still sometimes regret not doing that, but you know, I, I it's just I as painful some on, weeks. Uh, yeah, I learned early on. I'm like, science is not my thing. So I found my way to the business school and heard about supply chain, and and it was it was just an outstanding program. And yes, you're right. They're ranked, I think, number one for the last I don't know, 11, 12, 13 years. So it's it's just been a really really cool run that they're on. And and since we're talking about our, our beloved. Michigan. I know there's other supply chain schools in Michigan. I think Western Michigan, I think, has been on that list. That's yep. out in uh, Kalamazoo. University of Michigan's not real big into that. I'm sure they, that's not their thing. Central has something. Grand Valley has something. I think Eastern. By the way, Michigan is full of really big schools. So you might not hear of Eastern Michigan or Saginaw or um, Grand Valley. These are huge schools, 20,000 yeah. kids. Central Michigan, 20,000 kids. <laughs> Yeah, next to Michigan State Central is probably one of the where I see just a ton of people come out of their supply chain. They have a kind of a combined supply chain and marketing degree, and it's an outstanding program as well. I'm biased because I'm from there, but I always say automotive is the biggest, baddest supply chain on earth. <laughs> it, it really is. It, it's driven, <laughs> I think it's driven so much in the state of Michigan just from supply chain. It's it's incredible. So. Right. So you went to Michigan State, got the supply chain yep. degree. What was your first gig out of school? So you'll, you'll laugh. My first gig out of school was actually uh, moving to Houston and becoming an ener energy broker. So absolutely nothing to do with supply chain. Did, did you so work at Enron? Was, I, Enron was one of my clients <laughs> when that whole thing happened. So that was that was fun. Nicely done, Todd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I took down the energy market. But yeah, I brokered energy for five years. Uh, it's it's kind of like the automotive industry in Detroit. You move to Houston, and that's all you all there uh, is oil and gas. There's no business so like oil business. <laughs> yes, hundred percent. So you know, I did that. Uh, I met my wife down in Texas. She was one of the you know five people in Texas that hated Texas. Uh, so she wanted to move out and. She uh, she got us back to Michigan, uh, and that's when I really got back into into my major. So my first job in supply chain was working for a, a small 3PL out of Ohio, um, and I just started as a, a load planner. I was booking freight for many well-known tier one, tier two automotive suppliers, and, and that's really where I cut my teeth doing it. And then what was your next gig? So from from there, actually, that was Interchez Logistics. Uh, I moved over to another small 3PL, did a short stint, and then really where things kicked off for me was I got an opportunity to go over to Menlo and now XPO, but at the time Menlo and I 
I came on right as we were launching uh, the GMCCA account. So that was a, a big experience. I was, I was hired in there to really oversee the entire operational piece of that account and through the launch of it. So if you're talking career highlights, that was a big one because when we, when we started the implementation of that, it was supposed to be about a six to nine month implementation, which we ended up cramming into about 12 weeks. <laughs> talking about, you know, talking about half a billion and spend 300 people staffed on the account and you got to launch that thing in 12 weeks. So oh. that was quite a task. Yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's automotive. So, yeah. um, so when did, when did you join Blue Grace? Sure. So, you know, I spent some time at, at Menlo. Uh, I was actually on site at GM for many years, uh, went over actually to the Conway organization when I was there through the XPO purchase. And then I, I had gone over and become the VP of supply chain for England Logistics. Uh, oh, then, another big one. Yeah. Yep. So I was at England and uh, I ran their entire supply chain group um, out of our Michigan office. Did that for a while. And then I got a call from a buddy of mine who we worked together uh, on the GM account. And he had moved down to Tampa, um, started working at Blue Grace as the VP of sales, uh, and was just crushing it on the sales side. Gave me a call and he said, hey, we, we want you to come down and, and help us on the operations side. And at the time I said, nope, not moving the family to Tampa. That's, that's, not, that's not in the cards for me. But ultimately I flew down, met with the leadership team here, which is just an incredible leadership team. And that for me, coming from Menlo, Menlo was really well known for their culture how they treat employees, just the, you know, the, the fun but serious work environment. And I hadn't really found that exact environment again. Um, and when I came down and met the team at Blue Grace, I knew it was going to be very similar. Uh, so that, that was a huge draw for me. Called my wife, said, hey, interview went really well. And she hung up on me. So that was the, <laughs> <laughs> that was, she didn't want to move to Tampa? No, no, she didn't. So, but she was a trooper. She said, "All right, let's do this," and packed up the three kids, and, and we moved down to Tampa. So, and and then you just recently moved back to Michigan. Yes, we did. So, I spent three years in Tampa helping just really build out the operational side of things on our managed trans side, really the you know process structure things like that, and then part of what you know we can talk about today drove us uh, to to look at opening an office in Michigan, um, and it was a an easy fit for me to bring the, the family back home. All and, right. And yeah, so that was good stuff. So when we were prepping, we were talking about the, a lot of different things, about what's going on. And we decided to talk about, I know with with Blue Grace, we could talk probably about half the industry. But one of the things I haven't talked much about lately is the LTL market. I hear people talk to me about it, the challenges that's going on. And that's what we're doing, surviving the LTL market. And talk about some of the challenges that are going on right now. What's go, what, if you're LTL shipper, what's happening? What's happening at the sure. LTL carriers? Absolutely. So I think you look at labor shortages being one of the biggest things out there right now. So, and I think any customer who is shipping anything right now, LTL, any mode, they're experiencing it in their own business. Um, and, it, and it's driving a lot of pain just throughout the entire industry, throughout all industries. But it has hit the LTL industry very hard as well. So if you think about all the dock workers, you think about the drivers, you think about the office staff, customer service, everything, having trouble staffing all those different positions has caused a huge ripple effect. Now is it, it's, oh, we've always talked about the driver shortage, but when usually yeah. when I think yeah. we, when we're talking about the driver shortage, it's not necessarily less than truckload because that's a job you can be home every day from, right? It is, unless you're doing the long haul, you know, by the line haul. But, but yeah, it, but yes, it is. It's, you know, usually you've got the local routes and you can be home, but I think you're still seeing, so, you know, you've got the driver shortage, which yes, predominantly you're thinking truckload there, but now you've just got an overall labor shortage, labor shortage in the So it's the, it's the dock workers. It's the people answering the That's the biggest part. Yeah. It's the trying to get that freight loaded on the trucks, sorting the freight, the people answering the phones. Um, and, and so you're seeing so many impacts from that, you know, all, all the way through. So I hate to drag you down this rabbit hole, but no, I want to no. make sure everyone understands. So when we say LTL, we mean less than truckload. And yes. just in case somebody says, what are you talking about? So talk about the difference between truckload and less than truckload. Sure. So when you, when you think about shipping freight, you know, you have most companies will ship a pallet. I mean, if you're shipping small boxes, that's probably going parcel with UPS and FedEx. So most people are, are familiar with that, but 
then you get into where you're shipping a pallet or two pallets or four pallets. So the less than truckload industry is where you're shipping freight that is not going to take up an entire truck. So it's priced differently. You know, the way it moves through the market is differently where it's going from, you know, the, the place that you pick it up and then it goes to one of the LTL carriers facilities. It gets split out on the dock loaded on a different trailer. So it's making multiple stops along right. the way. And, and it's priced completely different than, than a truckload with tariffs and, and things like right. that. So. And and I, I've described it this way to people is if I needed to send two pallets to California, say from Detroit where we're at, and two pallets, I don't want a whole truck. I don't want to pay whatever yeah. that exorbitant price is. So ideally, I'd say I would like to put it on the back of a truck that already has some other pallets on it. Well, this became like this shared trailer. And so th- the pricing is higher per pallet, but I'm only paying for two pallets. So it's going to be much you're cheaper. Only, yeah. You're paying for the space you're using. And when you talk about this market, the way it typically works is uh, there'll be a terminal here in the Detroit area and they go on a route in the morning and drop, or, or they, I guess they pick up in the morning. They'll pick up at all these locations, bring all that freight back to their terminal, and then it gets routed you know, north, south, east, west, right? Yep, and, exactly. And, and then in the afternoon, they deliver. So they go back on a route to deliver. And that driver might be driving all over the Detroit metro area. It's it's almost like being a milkman. <laughs> I mean, if, if anyone understands what the milkman did. So it's very much a route-driven. Super, super important to companies like automotive suppliers, like CP or retail, CPG. Everybody really, really needs this. So it's it's a critically important. It's much smaller market than than the truckload market. And I think what's also different about it is I think we have like seven eight players that make up eighty percent of the market. Hundred percent, yeah. You have a much smaller pool of carriers that do this versus you look at a truckload market. There's sixty thousand. I'm probably way undershooting that, but there's you got tons of carriers. Right, and the biggest the biggest truckload carrier has like what one and a half percent of the market, two percent right. of the market. And the and the top six or seven eight LTL carriers. I haven't looked lately, but it's eighty ninety percent of the market. I think yep. the top twenty five have ninety percent of the market. So they're kind of the only game in town, and there's not that many that are national. Yep. So yeah, you have your regional carriers that only play in maybe the southeast and you know northwest, and then you've got your your handful of national carriers that the big big guys that you know of. Right. So. They're struggling with this labor crisis that everybody is, but but we've become very dependent. The supply chains become very dependent on them, and it's it's a little ragged right now. That's why, for, hence the title, surviving the LTL market. We hope they they survive the LTL market. It's a tough time. So, what are some of the things that are going on inside of the LTL companies? How are they interacting with both companies like Blue Grace, which I know you guys bring a lot of business to them, and also with the shippers? How are they how are they dealing with this problem? Yeah, so I think you're seeing you're seeing a lot of different things right now out of the LTL carriers. So, you know, based on the you know the capacity labor shortage issues, um, you're seeing higher prices. So, when you think of the LTL market, one of the things that they do historically is called the GRI or the general rate increases. So every year they evaluate their business and the customers that they have, and they'll come to you with you know a couple points. It might be a you know two or three percent increase on your on your account specific pricing. Right. To, now you're seeing upwards of 20 and 30 percent increases depending on the customers and the lanes and and that's strategic on their part and they're obviously looking and saying these lanes are not operating well and we're struggling to find capacity and drivers we're going to put huge increases on these if we keep them great they're profitable or they're probably going to go away and go to a different carrier so you're seeing some strategic moves on their part from a pricing standpoint to severely increase prices on business that is not operating well for them. So, so what's another thing you're seeing? So, some of the other things you're seeing is embargoes. So, we've seen more embargoes this what's year. What's an embargo? embargo. Yes. Yeah, so, I'll explain the embargo. So, when the carriers they're looking at all their lanes, you know, the zip code, the zip code lanes that they're they're moving, they'll come to us and say, "Hey, Blue Grace, for the next two weeks, we're shutting this lane off. We are not going to move freight in this corridor. So, the, this zip to zip point is no longer served. We're not going to serve it." And that's going to allow them to try and catch up on all the freight they have sitting there that they haven't been able to move. So, you know, they'll they'll continue moving freight in that lane, but they won't take any new freight for that lane for the next couple of weeks. 
So that means they just got either overwhelmed or they lost a driver or they lost the terminal staff, whatever happened, they're struggling. Yeah, they're seeing, and what's typically happening is we're going to the carrier complaining along with every other 3PL and every other vendor saying, guys, I've had freight sitting on your dock for two and three weeks. What is going on here? And as they, those calls start coming in, that's when you start to see those embargoes of, yeah, we're extremely behind. We can't move the bills. We're going to shut service to this lane off. I think... Tr- Traditionally, we expect to see, I'm I'm going to date myself a little with the, my dates, but 95, 96, 97% on time with LTL before Armageddon hit here. And what would you say you're seeing now on, in terms of on time? That, that, that is basically just, they estimated two days, they got it in three days, that's late. You estimate two days, you make two days on time. Yeah, correct. Yes. So yeah, whatever their published transit is. So, you you know, you're seeing in the low to mid 80s um, a lot. That's better than I thought you'd say. (laughs) Well, and that's and then you're seeing but that that is I'd say probably on average of what we're seeing across our managed customers. And then you're seeing all the way down in the 60s and 70s from some providers. So, you know, your top guys, you know, there's some some LTL carriers that are just known for service and they are going to ensure they hit that service. You can say you can say their name. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, No, I mean, old (laughs) Minion is one of the best out there, right? So they're they're known for their service. Uh, you know, FedEx is still extremely good from a service standpoint, although they're, they've struggled lately. Um, so you know, the, some of those carriers you're still seeing some pretty high, but it also is very it's in pockets and it's based on where are they performing well for certain customers. So we might have Old Dominion still in the high 90s for one customer and in the mid 80s for another, depending on the the freight and the lanes. Right. And since you work with all these different LTL carriers, you know this and you bring this to your customers, is that certain LTL companies will be really good in one lane and they will be less good in another. And they'll be probably be very happy to tell you where they're strong and where they're weak. Oh, yeah. They will do things where they're weak in the past. But imagine right now they're saying, you know, don't count on us in our weak lanes, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's part of the collaborative relationship uh, that you've got to build with these providers. And you've got to have a team of people that has the relationship with these LTL carriers and has those conversations. And you're looking at your book of business with them and you're having those discussions around where are we doing well, where are we doing bad, and should we shift freight to a different provider right now until you can recover in some of these areas. Damn. So so one of the things you saw is you're seeing embargoes and you're seeing service is not as high as it once was. Yeah. And for good reason. I'm not being critical. This, these, these, there's nobody wants to do a bad job. This is a traditionally no. a very good business. Yes. It will, runs well. I, I know some people are listening going, yeah, but isn't there a lot more damage than less than the truckload? There's more handling, but there's a lot less damage than there used to be. I think I think there's been a little bit of a struggle over the last five years, even before COVID, but it is a critically important space for us. Yeah, it really is. And, and you know, the LTO, that, that's part of this, right? They don't want to have the struggle. It's it's just what is going on in the market. And the nice thing is, is our LTO partners, they are great partners and they're we're meeting with them regularly and they're being very transparent and telling us how they can help and where things can get better. And that's that, that's that collaboration that's so important to have. I would, I, you mentioned the embargo. I would rather them tell me, I don't want this lane right now. So you can tell your customers, we're not, we're not moving, we're not moving as much freight there, or I got to put you on a truckload. I mean, yeah, I got to right. consolidate two or three of your LTLs into one truckload as opposed to, don't tell me, and then I got stuck on the dock for three weeks. <laughs> Absolutely, and that's so important, and it, and it allows us to go into our system, shut that lane off, and push the freight to other providers, uh, and then they come back and say, "Hey guys, we're ready. Turn it back on." So that communication is huge, uh, and and that proactive, you know, it allows us to be proactive with our clients, communicate to them what's going on, and come up with an alternate solution. So it, it is good. Right. So you guys were, you have relationships with all the top LTL carriers. Not everybody yep. does. They don't necessarily yeah. want to give rates to everybody, but they give you blanket rates that you, that are probably pretty attractive to most shippers. But basically, since you have the volume with them and you're a partner with them, and then you get account specific pricing, your pricing, I'm sure, has gone up, but it's still better than most shippers can get, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a couple things to that. So yes, it's because we have volume, but 
you know, there's there's other stuff that goes into that. It's the relationship. Our leadership team has extremely deep roots in the LTL industry. Most of our you know executives came from that world, from companies like YRC or Central Transport or Southeastern, and and it's built just years and years of of relationship there. So you know, the way that we operate, we're very transparent with them, uh, and there's a lot of things we do to make sure we maintain those relationships because it's critical. I mean, to your point earlier. Moving freight through this LTL market is it's it's a must. You know you can't just send things truckload. It's it's a need for customers. It's not going away. It is just a critical component of logistics and transportation. So having having that relationship piece and those deep roots is a big thing for us. Yep. So right now we're seeing higher prices. No surprise there. We all knew that was happening. We're seeing actual embargoes where they say no more and they're stopped selling. So they they're telling you. Stop selling in this lane because we don't want it. And prices have obviously gone up. So what can, well, first of all, I'll throw this out there just in case people are, are actual shippers listening. You're still better off in my mind. This is just me speaking. You can have direct relationship with the LTL carriers. And if you can get that, good for you. I think in a lot of cases, people need more service. They need the technology and they're going to need multiple LTL carriers. That's why I always say that's when you hire a 3PL like yours. And you probably still get pretty attractive uh, blankets from these guys better than you can negotiate on your own. Plus you get their, their technology and their dedicated team. To me, that's a slam dunk. I understand why people go through 3PLs in this case. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, and yeah, you can't even get blankets, so they won't, they won't give them to you. But yeah, it's having that piece, you know, trying to do it directly is just very difficult right and, now. And, and describe what a blanket is. So people aren't wondering. A blanket rate is, you know, from an LTL carrier, they give you rates that aren't specific to a customer. It's specific to your company that you can move other people's freight on. So for instance, in our transactional world, you know, we have people that can call a, a vendor or shipper and say, Hey, do you want to move some freight with us today? And they can ship it that day on these blanket rates. It doesn't because it's not in their name. And then you have the account specific pricing, which is we put a bid out specific to one individual customer using their data to get pricing for them specific that nobody else has, right? So that's the difference. So mean Todd and Blue Grace can use that for XYZ automotive company and no one else. And and that's and that, that that's the LTL carrier's way of kind of making sure they understand how they're covered for because they're looking they're at the whole region and saying what business do we want what business do we want to go through with our yeah. 3PL partners yes and it's also very specific to the type of freight right so if you you know for an LTL carrier you have a giant piece of foam that's not very attractive and you got a little bucket of paint that's a little more attractive because it's more dense it doesn't take up as much space so when they're pricing a customer they want to understand exactly what is the freight that's moving what's the what's the volume and they base their rates on that and there's some freight class not to get too much into LTL but the freight class is based on the, the density size and that helps drive the pricing as well yep so talk about a little bit about density you mentioned nobody wants to ship foam and you 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 get cheaper prices for sending bricks than feathers, right? Why is that? So it's because if you think same, about the-, the same, same, uh, same volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it just, they're able to pack a lot more of bricks into a truck than they are feathers. So, and it just, it doesn't operate well in their network. It takes up a lot of space that could be used to move a lot more freight for a different client. So they have to price that accordingly. Right. So it's, you know, if you if you've got- three giant pieces of foam for one customer and you think about the sales for those three giant pieces of foam versus 4,000 bricks, it, it just doesn't doesn't calculate the same. So we're going to give better pricing because we want those bricks. We don't want the big pieces of foam. And that's the other, you know, the other thing you're seeing right now in the LTL market is linear foot rules. So you've got a certain point on the LTL truck where let's say, you know, in historically it might've been 20 feet. Hey, we'll let you take up 20 feet of space on our truck and we'll give you your normal LTL pricing where you're paying for that space. Once you go above that, you get hit with some massive fees where it really usually becomes more cost-effective to go to a full truckload. They're ratcheting those, those levels down now to where you're seeing, hey, now you can't really go over 10 feet because they just don't want those huge shipments on their trucks right now. 
So, so if I've talked about an average size palette, what is that? Forty-eight by 40 forty-eight by forty-eight by forty-five. Yeah, right, usually. Right. It's, it's so, right how many? When you say twenty feet, that is what eight? Yeah, you're probably looking at eight to twelve pallets. Uh, trying. Right. I mean, assume our team is kind of trained that if you see more than eight pallets at a shipment, you better calculate the size of that shipment and make sure it's, it should go LTL still. And our system does a lot of that for you, but they just have that programmed in their head. Yeah, and this is another thing. So guys, when you think about getting an LTL, you are sharing a truck and it, they have very a complex pricing, which by the way, I think they're going to change over time because the current way is ridiculous. I think I think that's recognized by the whole industry. It's, it's a ridiculous way of doing business. The reason I say that is because that complexity is really the enemy of quality. So you, sometimes you get bad pricing. I know companies like yours probably pride themselves on having the correct pricing, but it's not unusual if you're an LTL shipper to find that your what you're paying is different than what you thought you were paying. <laughs> Yeah, and that's you know that's a big piece too. You talked about the companies that want to do it themselves versus working with the three PL, and it it I totally understand. You know, well, I want to cut the margin out, or I want you know I want to do this, but it, there's so much value that goes into working with a good partner, and and you got to make sure the partner's doing what they told you, but auditing those bills, paying the bills for you, making sure you are getting the right cost, and making sure it is right. shipping the right mode, things like that are just critical. Oh yeah, so like and this is I'll just throw this out there. Let's just say I'm a little yeah. manufacturer and I go, well, I only I sell like move 20, 20 shipments a week LTL, so I don't really need I don't need a Blue Grace. I'm not obviously I'm not a, the biggest customer over at this LTL company. So when I call and complain and say, oh my god, you screwed me over on this or that, they're they're, they're unhappy and they want to make sure I'm ha- satisfied with their service, but when Todd calls. He calls on the bat phone. <laughs> He's able to say <laughs> they know darn well who Todd is because they do tons and tons of shipments. And so that little carrier could get better, potentially better pricing. But I will say it's not necessary. Don't go there for pricing. Go there for the service because they're going to audit every single shipment to make sure you got the right pricing. They're going to give you advice on being a better shipper so you can get better rates. They're going to give you infinitely more than service than you would get without them. Yeah. And, and usually better pricing too. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I was going to say, you're, normally you're going to save money. Yeah. But that's not what we sell. It's, it's really not. And you, you nailed it. It's the service. It's the, it's the, you know, the relationship that we have, it's the strategy, it's the creativity, it's the process, it's the team. You know, you're buying a lot and the systems and the data. And I go on and on about all the value that you get and you're not having to do any of that. So you go focus on selling your widget. And most likely you got a dedicated team on your freight. So yep. when you say what went wrong, I don't, I don't want to hire a dedicated guy to track shipments. You get Blue Grace or, or a company like theirs, you get that. And I used to hear when I used to sell a less than truckload services, every once in a while, someone would say, you're just a middleman. I'm like, yeah, I'm just a middleman, but I'm a middleman who brought you technology that you didn't already have. I brought you cheaper prices. I gave you a dedicated head. So I'm a middle, <laughs> not exactly yeah. a middleman, a middleman. You just think about, I did added no value in the middle. And I just, uh, I, I made a lot of money just by selling someone else's services. That's not what current 3PLs do, not in the LTL space. No, not at all. And, and it's a lot about that continuous improvement piece too, right? It, it's about driving value and projects and things like that. So it goes far beyond just picking up and delivering freight. So I want to switch gears just a little bit. So we talked a little bit about this, what's going on. We, we know the LTL companies are really struggling with labor shortages. That's not just drivers. That's on the dock. That's in the in their, their operation staff. Everything is short. As a result, we're seeing service breakdowns going from the high 90s to the low 80s in terms of on-time performance. I'm sure there's probably some billing issues and other challenges that are going on right now. I'm sure communications less than perfect. And again, I wish them well. I know they're working the butts yeah. off for this. Prices have gone up. So what can a shipper do today to, to, to survive this? Because that's the name of the podcast today, Todd. Todd, how are we going to survive this LTL market? Well, I, you know, I think some of it's creativity, right? I think, and, and I think part of that working with a 3PL is ensuring that there's collaboration and ensuring that you are talking to your customers and to, you know, 3PLs and the customers are talking to each other and understanding 
exactly what those challenges are, what can we do to shift and do things differently and uh, give them some options. Yeah, give them some different options. So if, if one carrier is not performing well because it's a certain area, if you're doing this on your own, you may not know where to go from there. So, you know, that's really where our team comes in is to, to constantly, we, we do, whether it's monthly or quarterly business reviews, we're looking at that data and we're looking at the data daily and weekly, but we're looking at that data with our customers in collaboration to say, hey, here's what this looked like from these regions to here. Here's where we're seeing that actually we're performing real, the carriers are performing extremely well, but here's maybe where they're not. Here's our suggestion. We would take this freight and shift it over here and let's see how that goes for the next you know 30 days that should improve the service and we, we're constantly playing with that and we're having those conversations but i think it's it really comes down to communication collaboration and creativity uh are, are the things right now that really you have to be open to todd you know it's interesting when we were prepping and you said just that i was like i totally agree but doesn't everybody say that and yeah. and and i think it comes down to you have to have the culture and the management will to make sure that you're doing that as a 3PL. Yeah, absolutely. It's accountability, right? So you, you've got to execute on what you said you're going to do, and you've got to have a culture of accountability. You've got to have people in place and tools and systems in place to make sure that you have visibility to that stuff. So, you know, you have to have a team that is going to do what they say, and then you've got to have some level of oversight and management and leadership that is able to see that and make sure and help uh, help your team strategize and really kind of just check the box, right? Are we having those conversations with our customers? Are we presenting them with these options? Yeah, but don't you, you mentioned having people in place? Are you guys struggling with headcount? You know, it's funny. Yeah, it's yeah. Finding good people right now is extremely difficult. We've been pretty lucky, and we've back to the creativity point. We've done things to help us make sure we are finding people. So opening our office in Detroit was a huge piece of that. We we knew with those schools that were there, with the automotive industry, manufacturing, all the things that reside in Detroit. I mean, if you think of Chicago as kind of like the mecca for brokerage, I kind of look at Detroit as the mecca for supply chain. I mean, right. It really is. So putting an office there has allowed us to recruit some incredible talent and much faster than I ever anticipated. So we're growing that office very fast. We've also opened an office in Phoenix. So another really up and coming area. It helps us with the West Coast you know, side of things. So we're using a little bit of creativity on opening new offices where you see some people might be kind of closing and going to that more work from home model. We're opening more spaces to help us recruit people in and we're having really good success with that. Yeah, that's important to have a, a presence here, I think, just because there's so much freight here also. But um, I would also say just we do have a focus on supply chain. Again, I always say the automotive is the biggest, baddest supply chain on earth. And and it's reflected in how many supply chain people we have and how many engineers we have. Right. <laughs> so I say this sometimes. I remember a recruiter asking me, I said this in my last podcast, but a recruiter had asked me to talk to them and uh, – this is years ago. I was working as an engineer and they kept saying, with your supply chain background, I kept saying, what the hell does that mean? I didn't know what a supply chain was. <laughs> and I was thinking, right. I'm, now I know I was right smack in the middle of it. But I was at the time, I was like, like he's making up words. But so you guys are to combat this labor shortage. You guys are opening offices and new places to try and get headcount. So your guys' main office is down in Tampa and then you just open a new one in, in Detroit and Phoenix, where else are you guys located? So we've got uh, Chattanooga. So we have a, a good presence in Chattanooga. Of course. <laughs> yes, yeah, you gotta be in Chattanooga. Chicago, so we've got a large of office inside the loop in Chicago. And then the Twin Cities now, we're opening, just, oh, nice. just announced yesterday, we're opening an office there. Um, and then we've got some other smaller offices around um, Oklahoma and, and a few others, but those are those are some of the biggest ones that we have right now with Twin Cities, Detroit, and uh, Phoenix being the, the newest. And really, I mean, when you think about it, you could, you know, with the nature of logistics, you could say, we're just going to do this from one location, which is Tampa, yeah. Florida. And you guys are right. saying, we want to be closer to some some key customers. But on top of that, we want to go get that headcount. We want to be able to go get recruit the best people. And, and and if somebody decides they don't want to leave Michigan because they love our weather, and <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yes, well, we're, we're we're here, so uh, we have options, but we like it. So if somebody says I don't want to leave, your wife did want to leave here, right? Nope, she did not. Yep, she, she and she's and she's from Texas, so yeah. Uh, 
So people want to stay home sometimes. So it, it makes sense to open up these offices. So I want to make sure we covered everything we wanted to talk about. So we talked a lot about this, this labor problem and they're really hurting the LTL companies. And as a result, we're seeing poor service. They're telling, they're telling us stop selling the embargoes, not working in this lane, communication problems, service failures, and pricing has gone up across the board. And I think you said the name of the game is getting with the three PL that, you know, probably has a little more clout than you do. But in addition, this is their job. This is what they do. And and when you're working with uh, 3PL, you really got to collaborate. I've said this a few times in my podcast. You're a shipper. You don't want to hold your 3PL at arm's length. This is the time to really lean on them and go, man, Todd, help me. Don't, don't, uh, don't hold them at arm's length. Bring them in. Bring them in. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think that's where we've seen the absolute greatest results are when we have our customers that just want to meet with us and sit down. We did about two weeks ago, I flew uh, flew to North Carolina to meet with one of our customers and it wasn't even a QBR. We, we did three hours of just strategy. Just what are your, what does your business look like for the next six months? How can we embed ourselves more? How can we help you hit your goals? Right. Having those conversations is, is huge and you just come away with so many good things. Right. You know, it's funny. Uh, when I was still at a 3PL, I remember having a few customers who were complaining about things. And I, the ones who complained were the ones who typically didn't want to do the QBR, didn't want to have a weekly meeting. The ones that we had the weekly meetings on, we were just, we were joined at the hip. We could provide such better service. And then I remember going over and these guys said, look at our prices. And, and I remember looking at all of the, what they were paying. And I said, there's four pallets went in that truckload and three like that. And that, that was on you guys. You, yeah. you ordered a truck and put four pallets on it. And now right. you're angry at me about it. I, I said, we would have put that on an LTL shipment and look at all these expedites. I said, these expedites are not our fault and I'm not trying to deflect, but if you don't no, work it's... with your three PL closely, don't bitch about the pricing. <laughs> No, you're hundred percent right. And then that typically is the case, right? It's the ones where you're not talking to them regularly because they don't want to engage. They just kind of hired you and expect it to show up. It is a team. It's supposed to be a team effort. You know, right. it's, you know, we want to take on the work, but we need input. We need collaboration. We need communication. That's just, that's key. Yeah. And you know, during these very difficult times, you and you call Todd and his team over there at Blue Grace or any other 3PL, they have been down a lot of a lot of roads. So things that are brand new to you might not be new to them. Most likely isn't new to them. They might have heard it from your, they might have heard, already heard it from your competition. They already know the problems you have. So it really is. I mean, it's, it really comes down to that collaboration and executing on the things you say you're going to, every 3PL says they're going to do these things. It's the execution. Anyway, enough of my blather. F- final thoughts on this topic, Todd. And then I want to talk a little bit about how we reach out to Blue Grace. Yeah, sure. No, I, I first of all, I appreciate the time. It's a it's a fun topic, and you know, it's something that is absolutely going on out there right now. That you know, our customers. I think I think you look back a year ago or so, and the customers were just not almost even believing some of these things. And now it's so prevalent in the news with the labor shortages and, and what's going on that the customers have really come around to yeah, okay, we know this is bad. Help us and help us understand. When is this going to end? Which I'd be rich if I could answer that. <laughs> but what can we do until it does? And when is it going to shift? And and I just think it's it's something that is is so important to make sure that you are communicating with your partners. You're you're building relationships with these LTL providers. Um, you know, and, and they are they're working as hard as they possibly can to get this freight out and make sure it's delivering on time and providing that service that you're used to. Um, and I think just, you know, working with good partners right now is going to help until that, until we get to those points where it starts to clear up. Excellent. Excellent. Well, before you go, yeah. what's, what's new at Blue Grace? Who's your sweet spot? Who do you serve? So we serve, you know, I, I, it's going to sound cheesy, but we serve everybody. I mean, our, I'll tell you, I've worked heavily in the automotive industry prior to Blue Grace where 90% of my customers were automotive. At Blue Grace, we are super diverse, um, you know, CPG, automotive chemical we, we've got customers in pretty much every space so it's nice because we, we we know all those different industries fairly well um, so when a customer reaches out to us it's not new we understand the challenges they're facing um, and we really do have examples of how we help these clients and, and how we can help them so 
you know, those are all all areas we there really isn't a, a customer that we would say, no, that doesn't fit our model. Um, you know, we really do have solutions kind of across the board. And it's truckload, less than truckload? Do you guys do any parcel? Less than truckload. You know, we have partners that we work with on the parcel side. We, we intermodal rail, we'll do all that. So, you know, that's that's really our sweet spots there. Nice, nice. And so if we want to reach out to you, I'll put a, I'll put a yep. link to your LinkedIn yeah, profile. Perfect. I'll put a link to uh, any links you give me. I'm assuming you give me a Blue Grace link if you guys have any white yep. papers. Are you speaking at any conferences or webinars or anything like that? Well, I've done a bunch of these lately, but yeah, no, the, the next thing, there will be probably something coming up at Michigan State. I tend to get up to Michigan State to speak usually once or twice a year um, to the different supply chain classes or at a conference. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so that's usually uh, just, you know, tied in there a little bit more. And then, you know, yeah, as far as just reaching out, obviously our website, I'll give you the, the LinkedIn profiles and all that, but mybluegrace.com is our website and there's tons of info on there from jobs to reaching out to us as a customer and, and all different things. So it's the best way to get us. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Todd. I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Yep. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.